Uh, hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Paradin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the fast attack submarine USS Indianapolis, as well as many, many posts before and after that command. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing well. Thank you, Seth. That's great. I'm looking forward to this. How about you? Me too. Yeah, Excellent. really exciting. Excellent. Uh, so there are plenty of podcasts that go into every aspect of every single day of World War II. Um, this show will not do that. At least we'll try to not do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I speak for Bill here when I say that both he and I like the minutia, you know, the little known facts, the stories, the personalities, uh, both well known and not so well known. Uh, and that's what we want to bring to the table here. We want to talk about the aspects of this conflict, this great conflict that we find interesting. Uh, and in so doing, we'll tear down some of these mythical figures and stories, while at the same time, we hope to build new ones, not mythical, mind you, but uh, stories and figures that are actually true. Um, this show, for the most part, will not be a chronological history of the Pacific Theater of Operations, or PTO, as it was called, but more of an inviting conversation about topics that Bill and I hold dear or find interesting. Uh, and that being said, we're always open to suggestions. So if you've got them, send them in. Uh, without further ado, Bill, let's get rolling. Um, when discussing the Pacific theater of operations for World War II, especially for the United States, it's imperative that we start at the beginning of our involvement in that conflict. And that, of course, is Pearl Harbor. And while we'll not go through every step of every day because that's been done ad nauseum, we do want to talk about some of the things that have had or that did happen, could have happened or could have been prevented. Um, what do you think, Bill? I mean, you know, they say that historians often cite people like myself, often cite Japanese expansionism, imperialism, what have you, uh, for the Japanese desire to attack Pearl Harbor. Others say it was the United States embargoes, oil embargoes specifically, that led to the attack. Uh, which was it? What, what, what do you think? What do you think it was? What, why, I, why did the Japanese attack? I think it was a combination of the two. I mean, the truth is usually somewhere between there. You know, my interest in this topic comes from my Navy career, all of which was in the Pacific, all except all of my operational tours except for XO were in Pearl Harbor. And I lived across the street from Nimitz's old headquarters and across the street from his old house when I was in command of USS Indianapolis. And Commodore, I lived on Ford Island and I had the Arizona Memorial in my backyard. So I've thought about this for decades. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of my offices was Kimmel's office during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so, you know, the question of, you know, is it expansionism or did we kind of back the Japanese into a corner, um, forcing their hand on attacking us to neutralize us? And to, you know, their objective was to keep us from interfering with they saw as, you know, they called the greater East Asia Cope prosperity sphere, right? And uh, it's a mouthful. They, they, <laughs> yeah, they thought that Japan should be the dominant force in Asia, much like China believes they should be the dominant force in Asia today. Ironically, of course, China was a huge target of Japan when Japan's hegemony was, you know, expanding in the Pacific theater. And now it's China's hegemony. Um, and of course, they probably would do the same thing to Japan if they had the opportunity to do that. But there were people in Japan, as you know, Seth, who knew that their long-term prospects for neutering America in the Pacific weren't good, that they, they needed a swift, decisive victory if they were going to, you know, overcome our influence in the region. And it's, that's not the way it worked out, is it, Seth? No, it isn't. You know, the, the, the Japanese, if you go back to to what started all this, this uh, militarism, you know, is, is what it was really. Um, you go back, it starts in the twenties and it starts in the thirties and, and Japan uh, they're, you know, they were ruled by Emperor Hirohito, of course, you know, he was their, their godlike emperor, but that whole godlike emperor thing didn't really come into play until the thirties. Uh, and, and it was, pushed by the military militaristic factions within Japan that want to expand this. And, and, and you hit the nail right on the head when you said that we being the United States were their primary uh, 
um, enemy, even though we weren't at war with them yet. You know, we were the only ones that would more than likely have tried to stop them or could have stopped them uh, in, in their expansion. And, you know, Japan being an island nation is that they, they were and still are, you know, starved for a lot of natural resources. And you being a, a retired Navy skipper know that that, you know, naval vessels consume a lot of fuel. You know? mm-hmm. And one thing Japan was short on was oil. Um, and a lot of the areas that they wound up attacking and conquering in 41 and 42 were oil rich. So these are all places that the Japanese had in their target map, their lists of things that they wanted to acquire. And um, Admiral Yamamoto knew that, it, that if he was to have a free hand in the expansion of the Japanese empire in the Pacific, they had to do something to take out the United States, uh, the Pacific fleet specifically. And of course, us throwing an oil embargo on top of them uh, mm. didn't exactly endear us to their militaristic leaders at that time, you know, because we that was a direct threat to their plans for expansion, because if you can't have oil and we were the ones supplying, I believe it was over 80 percent of their oil at the time. If you can't have oil, you can't fuel your airplanes, you can't fuel your ships, you can't fuel your tanks, you can't move any of your troops, so you can't do anything. And it just it, you know, put their expansion, uh, you know, on hold really for a while until they were able to take it for themselves. Yeah, the interesting thing in what you just said, which is all true, is that um, neither country, I think, thought of each other as an enemy throughout that pre-war period. They thought of themselves as natural adversaries. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, and I, I hasten to point out that Captain Nimitz attended Admiral Togo's funeral, right? Met him as a young officer, as an ensign, and then later, we had a, an entire ship crew march in the funeral procession for Admiral Togo in the 1930s. And so this was not, th- there was a conflict that was about to happen between the two countries. It wasn't that we saw each other as enemies. In fact, you know, Yamamoto went to Harvard. I mean, right. there was a lot of counter, a lot of cross-pollinization between the navies and between you know diplomats and things like that, this was a very uh, good example of realpolitik, where the Japanese saw the, the conflict between Japan and, and the United States as something that had to happen to resolve the future of the Pacific, not necessarily something that they wanted to happen, right. but something that had to happen. Right. And again. They, those that knew us well, knew that if they didn't, they thought this would resolve as a real politic kind of event, which is we would, after our fleet was destroyed, we would see the handwriting on the wall, realize that we couldn't prosecute this war in the Pacific any further, and we would just basically sue for diplomatic resolution. Right. And that is not the way it worked out, of course. Most certainly not. And, you know, you, you bring up a good point when you talked about, you know, they didn't necessarily want to go to war uh, with the United States. There were several people uh, in, in, in the higher up uh, offices in Japan, uh, Japanese politics, that did want to go to war with the United States. But the one man who was adamant against against going to war with the United States was the man that designed the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was Isoruko Yamamoto. He was, as you said, you know, he Harvard educated, uh, traveled all across this country. And these are, you know, pretty well-known facts, but he, uh, he knew, he knew having seen with his own eyes, the industrial ability of the United States in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, he knew that they could never win a protracted war with the United States. So he was the one that was, the loudest critic of the plan to go to war. And ironically enough, he's the man that designed the plan to go to war. Right. But, but he, he said too, you know, I mean, he said, if, if fine, if, if we're going to do this, then we're going to do it my way. And this is what we're going to do. And of course that results at, you know, Kido Butai, the first carrier strike force flinging airplanes at Pearl Harbor on Sunday's morning, December 7th. But uh, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, if you look back at it, it probably I don't think it could have been prevented. I really don't. I, you know, and that—that's just my opinion. I, I think with 
with the the powers that be that were in Japan at the time, I think it was something, as you said, it was inevitable. I think it was going to happen. Um, and I mean, frankly, it, it, the, the things that happened, and we'll get into this in a minute, mm-hmm. but the things that happened in the attack, you know, everybody, Pearl Harbor was a disaster for the United States. I mean, that's, there's no, you know, covering that up. It, it, it was a disaster, but there were some of the things that happened at Pearl Harbor that probably helped us to become victorious as early as we did. You know, I mean, we started winning battles in 1942, less than six months or actually six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, midway, you know, midway. Run, obviously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but I mean, it's, and there were reasons that we were able to prosecute the war in the early part of the war that we were, and it was because mm-hmm. of Pearl Harbor. But, um, you know, talk- I, I do want to revisit the issue of, you know, whether or not, uh, with the United, to what extent the United States had active involvement in instigating the attack on Pearl Harbor, because there's been a debate since 1945. But, I, but before we leave that point you just made, things that happened in the attack on Pearl Harbor that almost accelerated our victory. One of those was the fact that the, the fleet was sunk in a harbor that was shallow enough to raise the battleships. Right. And every battleship except for Two. You know, Oklahoma and Arizona were recovered, right? Right. And and ended up fighting the war. That's point number one. Point number two, all these battleships that were in Pearl Harbor were old mm-hmm. and slow. And they weren't all that useful when it came to the prosecution of the war. And in fact, in most cases, they were relegated to defense of the landing forces kind of preparation of the beach for the landing forces. They weren't fast enough to keep up with the carriers. The third thing was the carriers were not in port when the attack occurred. They were just serendipitously happened to be out of port. And there were Japanese spies overlooking from Aya Heights, the harbor, and knew that the carriers weren't there. If the Japanese hit the pause button on the attack until the carriers returned, it would have been a very different outcome. Now, they they didn't want to do that because they were afraid they they would have been detected and then lose the element of surprise. And so there's a whole bunch of reasons why they didn't do that. The fourth thing is they didn't attack the submarines. And it was the submarines and the carrier that kind of kept us in the fight until the surface forces could be reconstituted. And of course, in 2020 hindsight, that ended up being a huge mistake, nor did they attack the oil farms. Right. Interestingly, those oil farms are in the news these days with the oil leaks polluting uh, the drinking water in Pearl Harbor. Um, here it is 80 years after the, the, you know, the attack, and, and we're still talking about those very same oil farms that the Japanese failed to attack back then. But, um, you know, all of these factors, which are, one could argue were significant oversights by the Japanese attacking force, the Kido Batai, um, went on to assist uh, the transformation of American battle doctrine, American naval battle doctrine, to shift to a carrier-based and submarine-based tactical you know, approach, operational art, uh, which is exactly what defeated Japan in the long run. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it, that's a beautiful point. And that's something that I, that I definitely wanted to bring up is that if you look at the Pacific War and you look at the history after Pearl Harbor, that's all the major battles, with the exception of two at Lady Gulf and four around Guadalcanal, all the major battles are aircraft carrier driven. And I'm not mm-hmm. just talking Midway and Coral Sea and Santa Cruz. I'm talking about like everything that was done after that. You right. know, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, uh, you know, the Philippines, they're all had carrier aircraft support. Why? Because that's how, that's all we had to use in 1942. Because mm-hmm. the Japanese, as you said, sank or heavily damaged all of our battleships at that time. Which, you know, there were a few that were being built, but they weren't ready to go. And, and in so doing, it forced the United States into a new type of naval warfare, the, the type of naval warfare that the Japanese had mastered already by 41, but by 44, you know, there wasn't a Navy in the, on the planet that could counter what we could do. Interestingly, the Japanese, of course, modeled themselves after the Brits, and the Brits right. were the first to kind of wake up to the opportunities presented by aircraft launched from ships, and the Japanese very 
quickly mimicked that. And we have, we did, of course, as well, but we were still run by the battleship admirals. Um, now, one would argue the Japanese did as well, and they were looking for that decisive surface battle, battleships versus battleships. All throughout the war, they thought that there would be a major de decisive battle. Of course, Leyte almost ended up being that. Could have could have been that been if the Japanese had pursued Leyte a little bit more aggressively. That's another episode of our podcast, <laughs> I think. Um, Halsey but did. It, yeah. <laughs> but they, had, they, of course, they initiated the Pacific campaign with a carrier attack on Pearl Harbor, forcing us to respond with our carriers as well. Because carriers and submarines were essentially all we had left. And the old joke, if the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. so for us, all we had was carriers and everything looked like nails. And there were a lot of opportunities for those hammers oh, yeah. in the Pacific War. And so it accelerated our conversion. There's no doubt about that. And, and ended up, that ended up being a really good thing for us. Oh, for sure. For sure. And then, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that, I think in some other episodes uh, and we'll discuss why that was, you know, was, I mean, the hit and run carrier raids of 42, you know, the Marshall mm -hmm. Islands wake and all that Marcus Islands, stuff like that. Those are all, you know, a direct result of Pearl Harbor and it's going to dictate how we play the rest of the war. But um, getting back to that morning on the 7th of December, you know, we talk about could have things been, could things have been prevented? Could things have come out differently and things like that? Uh, there were a lot of warnings that the Japanese were coming before they ever came, before they ever came. You know, there were a lot of warnings, uh, radar being one. Now, of course, there's a famous story about Opana Point, you know, yeah, detecting yeah. the Japanese coming the in. The B-17s. Right. Well, or yeah. so they thought, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I knew... Kermit Tyler, Kermit Tyler, uh, Colonel Kermit Tyler was the officer in charge at uh, Fort Shafter. He was the guy that Lockhart and Elliott, the radar operators at Opana Point, called and asked. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and he's been harpooned for years. You know, oh, if we just sent airplanes up, if he'd have, you know, interpreted that, you know, Pearl Harbor would have been a different story. I beg to differ. Uh, you know, first of all, in Colonel Tyler's defense, it was his first day on the job. Yeah. <laughs> he had very, hours, very little right? 12 yeah. hours or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And he had very little training uh, mm -hmm. in regards to that. He was a fighter pilot, but this particular thing, he had very uh, little training. Uh, so he didn't know. You know, he had no, no idea. Radar was essentially brand new. But if he had interpreted it properly, if he would have known this is the Japanese airstrike, which he could not have known. And they'd have scrambled airplanes at Wheeler and Hickam, you know, Eva Field, maybe, you know, whatever. What would have happened? What do you think would have happened? Nothing. They couldn't have done it because they didn't have enough aircraft to keep the combat, to keep the search surveillance mm -hmm. flights going, the rotation of surveillance airplanes, and the combat air patrol going. So at some point, they would, all these airplanes would have had to have landed. There right. just weren't enough. Um, but you can go back even further. I mean, Kimmel and Short received a radio message just a few, uh, you know, a few days earlier that said this should be considered a war warning. Right. And so they had plenty of warning that they needed to do something to, you know, in anticipation of a Japanese attack. Now, nobody knew where the Japanese were going to attack. And the notion that folks knew that it was going to be Hawaii, you know, has been debunked over the past 80 years. I mean, over and over and over again, people bring up some factoid, you know, we, you know, and almost all of them are fiction. The, the most likely place for this attack to have occurred was the Philippines, which makes it even less, less understandable why MacArthur had his aircraft lined up, you know, um, you know, wing, ducks, wing, yeah. wing tip to wing tip and sitting ducks, because most people believed the Philippines were going to be the target of this attack, not Hawaii. Ha be that as it may, there was enough notice that the, what, what they could have done was have forces on a higher state of readiness. Right. Not necessarily have airplanes in the air 24-7, which they didn't have the numbers of airplanes to keep that up, but 
have the ships on a higher state of readiness. That, that Sunday morning, basically, it was business as usual. Sailors were on liberty. They went on, got drunk the night before. Um, they had standed. The, the anti-aircraft ammunition was locked up in, in, in ammo lockers. Um, aircraft were wingtip wing tip to wingtip, which allowed them to be very efficiently attacked. Um, you know, the, the, it, was, it was just a normal Sunday morning. And, and what makes this worse is what happened with the USS Ward. Mm -hmm. where the USS Ward detected a midget submarine trying to penetrate Pearl Harbor, radioed in to, you know, to Naval District Hawaii, and they were completely discounted, mostly because, the, you know, there had been prior reports of submarines that turned out to be false. But those reports had not come in after the this should be considered a war warning message right. was sent, right? right. And, and, you know, maybe it was because the Ward's crew were reservists. Bottom line was, we had hours worth of warning that this attack was about to happen in Hawaii, and we did nothing about it. Right. Which is why all of the notion that Kimmel and Short were not guilty, you know, is, is nonsense. I mean, they, they absolutely had the opportunity to keep their commands at a higher state of readiness and fail to do so, 100% their fault. Oh, yeah, no no doubt. I, I don't think there's, uh, you certainly won't get in an argument out of me and that. I mean, you know, specifically with the ward, you know, if, if you take Kermit Tyler and, and Opana Point out of the picture and and the ward, I mean, this, and you put the, you focus on the ward, I mean, this is a United States Navy destroyer opening fire and sinking sinking submarine, yeah. a Japanese submarine yeah. that was trying to penetrate the defenses of Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. You would think at the very least that would have rang a bell in somebody's mind saying, oh, hell, we need to we need to scramble some airplanes. We need to do something, light off the boilers, get these ships moving, something. And it did jack squat. You know, as you mm -hmm. said, it, 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 you know, they sent the message. Captain Outerbridge was his name, the, the skipper of the CEO ward. of the ward. Yeah. Right. And he sent the, or he had the message sent uh, that they just sighted and attacked and sunk an enemy submarine. And it sat in a basket, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It was, it was handled in, as routine radio traffic rather than up immediate or flash traffic as it should have been. Right. And, but it still was um, read by leadership before the actual uh, air assault began. So, you know, we, we might have had 30 minutes of warning. We might have had an hour of warning instead of the three hours mm -hmm. from when the mes message was actually sent. Right. And um, it would have been something. People would have been at battle stations. We could have scrambled aircraft instead of allowing them to be bombed or, or spread them out or scattered them. None of that happened, of course. Right. And that, that fed this mythology that the attack on Pearl Harbor was something that Roosevelt wanted to have happen, needed to have happen to get us involved in the war. It is true that Roosevelt realized that without some kind of instigation, that it was going to be unlikely, it would have been difficult for us to enter the war in England's defense, in Europe's defense. Yep. But Nobody, not the Brits, not the Amer not American, you know, national leadership, thought that an attack by Japan against the United States was that thing that we needed, because everybody saw that as a distraction. We they thought we needed to enter the European conflict, and there was no guarantee that an attack by Japan, which would have prompted us to enter the Pacific conflict would have also resulted in us entering the European conflict. So if, if nothing, it was a distraction towards what Roosevelt really thought we needed to do, which was enter the war against Germany, not Japan. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of nonsense out there in the ether. The internet has, of course, amplified nonsense um, no. <laughs> for all things, uh, you know, I, I I respond to nonsense about 9-11 in the Pentagon. Since I was there, that was my Pearl Harbor, right? right. Um, all the time. And, and there's similar nonsense out there in the ether about, you know, Roosevelt's involvement or desire to, ha to have our fleet destroyed in Pearl Harbor, none of which 
was true. That's malarkey. I mean, President Roosevelt may he had his faults for sure, but he did not want 2,390 Americans to be killed in Pearl Harbor so we could get into a war that would ultimately see over 400,000 Americans killed. That's, that's you know, baloney, is, to put it nicely, is what Absolutely. it is. And, you know, I mean, I agree with you. I think Roosevelt knew that it, sooner or later it was going to happen. I mean, this is why the United States instituted the draft again in 1940. This is why, uh, you know, there were certain things that were starting to be uh, factories that were starting to be converted as early as 19, January 1941 to producing war material. I mean, he wasn't a fool. He knew it was going to happen sooner or mm -hmm. later. But as you said, I, nobody thought it was going to be the Japanese in the Pacific. And, you know, you go back to the war warning. And this is something I want to touch on uh, pretty, pretty heavy here of based on what you were saying, the war warning is, you know, it's sent out to them. You know, it, it was a threat. They, it was known that there was a threat coming from the Japanese and, and the, the reaction or lack thereof by command is something to be, you know, discussed, I think at, at, you know, at length. And, and the two people there are, are general Walter short and husband Kimmel. And what that means is they were blamed to blame for the, magnitude mm -hmm. of our loss. Of the destruction, right? right? Right. And so, no, did they instigate the attack? Did they invite not. it by, you know, by, you know, concentrating forces? Of course not. No, they weren't guilty they, for, for inviting the attack. Right. But the magnitude, over 2,000 Americans that was killed, the degree to which our surface fleet was destroyed and our, and our aviation, our Army and Marine Corps and Navy, aviation was destroyed during the battle that was all made worse by decisions that they either made or failed to make right. leading up to December 7th. I think one of the things too, and I've actually got it right here. I've got the, the message that was sent to short and Kimmel at roughly the same time. I think they received it within a day of each other in February, 1941 from secretary of war. Henry Stimson says concerning the defenses of Pearl Harbor quote, if war eventuates with Japan, it is believed easily possible that hostilities would be initiated by a surprise attack upon the fleet or the naval base of Pearl Harbor, end quote. The letter proceeded to say, quote, the dangers envisaged, envisaged in their order of importance and probability are considered to be one, air bombing attack, two, air torpedo plane attack, three, sabotage, four, submarine attack, five, mining, six, bombardment by gunfire, unquote. This is in February. <laughs> that yeah, exactly. this. And every single thing, with the exception of sabotage and bombardment by gunfire, occurred. Yep. Everything. Yeah. And, and it's, this is, you know, it, you got serious fault here at, 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 the, at the highest levels of command. You know, these guys, if nothing else, they had enough aircraft there. I'm not saying scramble them to, to repel the attack. Personally, I think the losses on American personnel would have been higher because of the P-40s and the P-36s that the Army Air Forces had there were, would have been no match for the Japanese zeros. Mm -hmm. None at all. I think we'd have lost more people, frankly. But you could if have sent out, If they were in the air. But, but right. you could have sent out searches. There were enough B-17s. There were enough PBYs, specifically PBYs, mm -hmm. that could really stretch their legs and get out there and just perform, you know, well, do their job. I mean, that's what PBYs were designed to do, yeah. our long air sea searches. And, and, and they were just sitting there, you know. Well, you'll remember that husband's predecessor basically resigned his position right. because he asked for more aircraft and um, the decision was made not to supply them so to support that now that you know that doesn't excuse kimmel for failing to um use what he had exactly but you know it was it richardson who you're the historian here not me. <laughs> but it was i think it was richardson who preceded kimmel was. who was he was very upset about two things you know the the order to move the fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. and concentrate the fleet in Pearl Harbor and the refusal to provide him what he thought he needed to conduct proper surveillance and defense of the fleet at Pearl Harbor. But you're right. There is plenty of warning here. And again, this is one of those lessons mm 
that I fear that we haven't learned in the past 80 years. And something like this is going to happen again. Sure. And we're going to, we're going to have indications and warning that some attack is coming and we're just not going to re- respond appropriately. And something really big is going to happen. It happened on 9-11 for that matter. For sure. And it affected I mean- me personally. And it's happened to smaller degrees elsewhere too. You know, I mean, right. this is, it's, as I say, history does repeat itself. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if to me, the easiest thing that could have been done would have been sending out search aircraft, and not just on the morning of December seventh, but every day. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is your main base in the Pacific Ocean. You know, FDR ordered the fleet out there as a deterrent to the Japanese, and of course, you know, all he did was put cheese in the trap there, but, you know, he didn't know that at the time. And I'll, no. I'll go to my dying day saying that Roosevelt had no clue, but uh, you know, you got your largest Naval base and it's not just Navy, of course, you know, it's all branches of the military in Pearl Harbor. And there was just, there was, you know, complete lack of security in terms of protecting what is there, you know, Short said that the Navy should have been in charge of reconnaissance, whereas Kimmel said, well, the Army should have been charge of, in charge of reconnaissance. And, they, and they're, they're fighting back and forth, back and forth, and nothing's getting done. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was a thing called the Roberts Commission, of course, which mm-hmm. went and investigated these two guys. And that's why they wound up harpooning them, and frankly, in my opinion, rightfully so. And the Roberts Commission said, and I got this here in front of me, says, uh, had the orders to prepare had the war warning been complied with, uh, the aircraft warning system of the Army should have been operating. The distant reconnaissance of the inshore air patrol of the Army should have been maintained. The anti-aircraft batteries, batteries of the Army should have been manned and supplied with ammunition, and the Navy, by the way. And mm-hmm. a high state of readiness of aircraft should have been in effect. Of course, none of this was done. I mean, right, literally exactly. not yeah. a single one. And, you know, if even half of that had been done, you, you might have been one of those guys might have been able to slip off the hook, if you will, but none of that was done. And, and, and you got to wonder why, you know, I personally think, and I know you and I have discussed this in the past that, you know, uh, especially within the Navy, uh, there, there was a certain arrogance in that, that the Japanese never could have mounted such an attack, you know, coming all the way from Japan, they never could have mounted such an attack. Number one, number two, without being have, detected, without being detected. Right. And number two, they didn't have the skill to do it. Like their pilots, you know, were you know, buck tooth, you know, inbred yeah, mongoloids. The, yeah, the racist. Um, yeah, exactly. And man, did they prove that theory wrong? They were the best carrier pilots in the world at the no time. Doubt. No, no doubt. We didn't. We didn't understand that or believe it. Right. Until yeah. it was, you know, until that finger went in our eye. Yeah. Then we yeah. had to believe it. At 7.55 yeah. that morning. I mean, it's, it, it's, and that's something that uh, we can talk about here too, talking about the the Japanese, you know, the, as I said, there was that arrogance that, you know, the Japanese never could attack the mighty U.S. fleet and knock it out in Pearl Harbor because the shallow, the harbor's too shallow and, you know, it could never make it that far without being detected and the Japanese simply couldn't do it anyway. But the Japanese proved it wrong, as I said, as, as we said, but the, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor in and of itself was a military feat on its own. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that went into this, uh, the, the planning for Pearl Harbor. Of course, we talked about Yamamoto. Uh, who was Yamamoto and, and how did he come to, to, to wrap his brain around this plan? And what did the Japanese do? to initiate this attack and, and carry it out and execute the attack with such absolute precision skill that they did. Well, Yamamoto was a terrific strategist. He wasn't a very good tactician. And that proved to be true later in the war as well, before he was finally killed um, when we intercepted a message that, that described where his airplane would be flying. But he, um, he was as close, I think, that as anybody in the Imperial Japanese Navy came to be an American of file. I think he really admired the United States and, and particularly our industrial might, our industrial capability. And he understood um, what Clausewitz in the 1800s had called centers of gravity. And he knew exactly what needed to be attacked to neutralize America's power in the region. So that was his strategic genius and brilliance. Of course, Nagumo was the commander of the Kirupatai and was the one who actually 
commanded the operation itself. But there were there was innovation all the way down the chain from the guy that decided that we needed they needed wooden fins on the back of the airdrop torpedoes so the airdrop torpedoes wouldn't you know dig into the mud Sink as they the were mud. dropped because they went they would go too deep and pearl harbor was too shallow to there, there was innovations all over the place to the to the person who decided you know what the sequence would be between torpedo bombers and dive bombers and fighters as they attacked the various installations and the, the, the ships in Pearl Harbor. This was a very well-coordinated att attack okay. on some levels. So we got lucky um, from a tactical uh, time on target standpoint, the Japanese didn't execute the way they could have. And, it, and what I'm saying is it could have been much worse for oh, us absolutely, than yeah. it did. I mean, you know, when they come in, you know, the first the first attack, you know, everybody focuses on the torpedo planes, on the capes coming in because those are the ship killers, you know. That's what capsized the Oklahoma. And I mean, every battleship that was on Battleship Row and including a lot of carriers, I mean, I'm sorry, cruisers rather, suffered significant torpedo damage with the exception being, of course, the Arizona that had already been destroyed by that time. But you know, the bombers come in, the first attack are by Val dive bombers. Mm -hmm. uh, they're and 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 zero fighters. They're coming in and they're strafing. If you look, I mean, they're strafing Fort um, Island. The, yeah, and the and yeah. the air defenses. They're coming mm -hmm. out, taking the runways out, the hangars, the planes, the airplanes, wing tip to wingtip, yeah. because they're coming in to knock that out. So the succeeding Japanese waves will theoretically be you know unencumbered by American aircraft mm -hmm. um, or defensive uh, attacks by American aircraft. And in that regard, they were almost flawless i mean they go in there and they just lay waste to the air defenses around pearl harbor yeah of course we did get some fighter planes get up in the air including you know uh, uh welsh and taylor uh, mm -hmm. who, who you know flew like a couple of madmen and shot down i believe what combined six or seven it's, japanese yeah. aircraft and until just they ran out of ammunition right twice mind twice, you they ran yeah. out twice and I mean, these guys were amazing, but they were, and they weren't the only ones that got up in the air. Gabby Gabreski, the later mm -hmm. of Zimke's Wolfpack fame, he got up on the morning of December 7th. He was in Pearl Harbor that day. Not a lot of people know that, but um, it, it's, it's the, the first wave is stunning. And, and a, it's a surprise. Uh, mm -hmm. B they come in there and they do lay waste to those aerial defenses for the most part. Um, However, you know, you said, you know, the, the response by the United States when the torpedo planes came in, when the Cates came in, if you look at pictures, uh, archival imagery of the attack, you know, the first waves, you know, there's not much anti-aircraft fire in the air. And you go and you look at footage or uh, images of the second wave. There's a lot of flak in the air. You know, there we, is, yeah. we responded pretty quickly considering... Mm. You know, it was party night the night before, you know, so I mean, there's a lot of guys that get, got to their battle stations and did their job pretty quickly, but still the skill in those torpedo plane pilots. And, and I hit on that because the discipline. Something. Oh, yeah. They're going to fly low and slow and straight. And yeah. and, you know, it's easier to, to, to shoot an airplane that's flying straight at you, straight than, at you than one that's coming. You know, that we've got some azimuth azimuthal movement, but. Um, and those guys stayed focused and stayed on target. You know, the the, um, the, the shot that, that capsized the Oklahoma is, of course, the old um, d debate as to whether or not a, a midget submarine got in there with its bigger uh, Type 95 torpedo and, and you know, which is about, about twice the, the explosive power as, as the airdrop torpedo and hit the Oklahoma. That's been an interesting debate as well with... Um, the, 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 the photograph that either does or does not show a Type 90 or a midget submarine rooster tailing um, water as it's lining up on the Oklahoma. Have you researched that at all? I have. And uh, I, I firmly believe that it is. I, I really do. And, we, and this goes back to the coordination and the planning of the attack. Um, you know, the, the reason that the war sunk that Japanese midget submarine in the first place is because that major submarine was trying to enter the harbor so it could coordinate its torpedo attack mm. with the torpedo attack from the Japanese aircraft. It was all supposed to be one 
you know, well-coordinated event. There was a plan to rendezvous on, by Lanai Island, but it was really just to make them feel better. Right. They, they knew they weren't going to survive. Yeah, they weren't coming out of there. Yeah. And, and I, I firmly believe that, that there was at least one Japanese midget submarine that did penetrate the harbor and accomplish its mission. I do. Well, there was, of course, there was one that got sunk inside uh, on the west side of Florida Island by the Monaghan. Um, it did get in and it did fire torpedoes at the Monaghan. But, and in fact, it was later recovered and it became landfill Display, right. submarine base, which where I was stationed for, you know, over a decade and a half. But, you know, the question is, and, and that guy that was the pilot of that midget submarine had been the instructor pilot for all the midget submarines. So it's no surprise he got in. He sure. was the best. I think he was the only lieutenant. The rest of them were ensigns. But it, it would not surprise me if a second one, because there's a, there is one that is unaccounted for. Right. The other midgets were all, are all accounted for, including the one that beached at Bellows Airfield near right. at the, you know, with um, with the first POW was the ensign um, that you know ran his midget aground at Bellows. But yeah, I, I'm I'm more inclined to believe that a second midget got into the harbor than not believe it. And whether or not that torpedo was one that capsized Oklahoma, we'll never know, I don't think. But uh, but it is an intriguing theory. I think it's completely possible. I really do. And, and I think that, that I, as I said, I, I believe that it, that it did happen. I mean, the photo, I'm no, I'm no uh, forensic an analyst, but uh, mm. you look at the picture and you look at the other things that are in that picture and then what happens to Oklahoma. I think, you know, this, this is a midget submarine. This does go back to that intense planning, this intense, you know, coordination that the Japanese had, had worked out for this attack, all masterminded by Aizuruko Yamamoto. And then mm -hmm. this is something that, that, I mean, in the Japanese uh, outlook, they did what they came to do. You know, they knocked out our surface force. But as you said, there was a lot of, as we said in the beginning, and you said just a bit ago, there were a lot of things that uh, did not uh, get touched. And, you know, there was criticism from Nagumo. Nagumo, you know, as you said, he was, mm -hmm. he was CEO of Kido Butai. He's on Akagi, bringing these uh, Japanese carriers close to Hawaii to, to launch the attack and everything. This is the third wave theory. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that they had a third wave ready to go or were preparing a third wave and uh, Nagumo felt that he had pushed his luck too far and, or was about to push his luck too far and wanted to beat feet and get out of there. He, well, uh, he had were, achieved all of his strategic objectives. Right. I right. mean, and so I don't fault him at all. I think he did exactly what he was ordered to do and, and his decision to cancel the third wave. I think, you know, even with 2020 hindsight, he probably could have gotten away with it. Probably what so. more was there to do, right? And so the submarines maybe, but submarines are awful small targets. Right. They're really hard to hit. You know, the people people like us are going to sit there and say, well, he could have come back and hit the oil tanks on the, on mm -hmm. the third wave. But that was never a list that I know on of. On his list, yeah. I could be wrong, but I, I don't believe that that was ever on the target list. Exactly. And yeah, that's true. It's, it's something that had he done that, had he hit that, and wipe those out because I mean an oil fire, you know, it's like a grease fire in your house. It's going to mm. boom spread like that. Those things that have gone up, you know, like yeah. Roman candles, but that would have forced everything back by at least six months to a year, as far as the United States is concerned, because Hawaii would no longer have been a viable naval base because we wouldn't have had any fuel. We couldn't mm -hmm. have gone in there. Yeah, it had taken a long time to rebuild those tanks. Mm -hmm. It's not that the fuel would have been lost; it's that the tanks would have been lost. Mm -hmm. And that takes a long time. Of course, they didn't have environmental impact statements back then. So it would have been quicker than, it, than today, but it, it would have taken a long time. You know, there's two points I think that aren't touched on on Pearl Harbor that, that uh, even wonderful histories that have been done, the most recent of which is Ian Tolles. Um, of course, there's a brand new history, a biography of Nimitz that's out, Nimitz at War. That, you know, since Nimitz wasn't there, it doesn't touch on Pearl Harbor much at all. And, you know, two, two aspects that are almost always overlooked. The first one is that there's a lot of civilians killed mm -hmm. on December 7th, 1941. And, and what a lot of people lose sight of is it, most of it was, was friendly fire. Mm 
Yes. Um, you know, when, when Any aircraft anti-aircraft aircraft fire goes up, it comes down. Right. And, uh, you know, so th- that aspect of it, it the friendly, for, now it's not to say that, you know, they shouldn't have been shooting. Of course they should have. But, you know, the whole business of, you know, the Japanese kill, targeted civilians, that's nonsense. Um, you know, to, to, there, were, there might have been some errant bombs dropped or things. Or, you know, but when planes were shot down, they crashed and, and that resulted in, in, in civilian deaths. But most of the civilian deaths were caused by American fire, not Japanese fire. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two, one of those friendly fire incidents was Kimmel himself. Right. He was in the office that later became my office when I was Commodore of Submarines in Hawaii. And a bullet came through the window. He was watching the attack unfold. Yeah, he was in, you know, he had planned on going golfing that morning. <laughs> Not somebody who thinks a war is about to start, is he? Right. No. And, and, and of course, he raced to Pearl Harbor when, when the attack began. And a bullet came through the window and hit him in a metal cigarette case. And he famously said, it would have been merciful if it had killed me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for years and years, people wrote that it was a Japanese bullet coming through the window. It was Japanese strafing. And it was funny because when I was at the academy as a physics major and I did the I did calculations to show if it was a Japanese bullet, it would have gone through the, the cigarette case and killed him. It was an American bullet <laughs> that had been fired up and came back down that didn't have enough kinetic energy to get through that metal cigarette case. So um, ironically, you know, decades later, that becomes my office. But, you know, the, the whole point of Kim understood his culpability in all of this. And he knew now that did he was he upset about being court martialed and did he fight it for, for years later, you know, until he died in the 50s? Yeah, he did. He, he thought he wasn't the only person to blame. And so he, in short, did did fight their court martial. But I think both of them knew that it was their fault. And some very famous people came to his defense in the 90s, including one of my acquaintances, Captain Edward Beach, who wrote the book Run Silent, Run Deep. People yep. probably know more it from the movie than the book. But Ed Beach, I became friendly with when I was in the submarine prospective commanding officer pipeline. And Ed Beach was beguiled into believing that Kimmel, in short, had been railroaded by some research that was done by a guy by the name of Robert Stinnett, who used FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, to draw a bunch of documents out and convinced Ed Beach. Ed Beach was fighting for Kimmel and Schwartz defense based on all of this, this research that Stinnett did. At the same time, I was fighting, campaigning for the exoneration of Captain McVeigh, USS Indianapolis fame. And, and, and Ed Beach and I had a couple of conversations. I was stationed in DC. He lived in outside of DC about Kimmel and Short. And I believed him. And, you know, Stinnett published his book in 2000, and sadly, Beach died in, I think, 2002 or 2003. Um, and it turns out most of Stinnett's research was nonsense. Right. It was invented. Fiction. Yeah. Fiction. And, and sadly, guys like him and John Toland, who wrote one of the wonderful histories of the Pacific War, um, you know, the, both of them were beguiled into believing this nonsense that Stinnett had been putting out, and that stuff is still kicking around the ether. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and it, and I think it always will. You know, I mean, there's always going to be people that are going to say, "Well, this happened. This could have happened. They knew about this. You know, all this kind of stuff." It's conspiracy theorists is what right. it is. It is, and and there's always going to be that. Talking about conspiracy theorists, you know, uh, you know, Stinnett's book. I, I agree. I personally, I have to admit, I have not read it. I, I mm. know of it, and I know about it. But he's not the only one, you know, I mean, there's so many conspiracy theories, especially about Pearl Harbor, you know, mm-hmm. why weren't the carriers there? Well, I can tell you why the carriers weren't there. It's pretty yeah. obvious, pretty easy to tell you. One was transporting marine aircraft uh, right. to, to Toronto Island. And, yep. and the other one was doing things. Yeah. And the other one was coming back. And the mm-hmm. other one, of course, being the Enterprise CV6. Yeah. CV6 was supposed to be in Pearl Harbor that morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everybody, oh God, you know, why, why wouldn't it there? It's because she was refueling her destroyers, her destroyer screen, mm-hmm. which was something that the United States was frankly in the early part of the war dreadful at. 
It took an inordinate amount of time to refuel ships at sea by the U.S. Navy, at least yep. until the end of 42, early 43, regardless of this. She ran mm. into a storm. Mm. She, it delayed her by, I believe, like somewhere between 10 and 12 hours. I don't remember exactly the timeline anymore, but she ran into a storm. It wasn't mm. like she was planning to, to not be there. It was obviously very, very lucky for the United States that she wasn't there. Right. But um you know, there's a lot of people that point to things like that. Why wasn't the Lexington there? You know, because she was supposed to be there as well. Well, it's because she was delivering planes, like you said. You know, she was mm-hmm. on her way back, but she she wasn't there. Yeah. And and it's it's something that uh, you know that you're never going to escape uh, conspiracy theories when it comes to Pearl Harbor. You know, I think of any any kind of battle uh, in the Pacific War, this is pr- probably the only one where you're going to get hammered with conspiracy theories all the time, you know, from FDR all the way down to the absence of the characters like we just talked about. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just an es- inescapable uh, thing when it comes to Pearl. Yep. We'll never know. So, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, the, the question that we started this episode with is, is, was Pearl Harbor preventable? You know, is it something that could have been prevented? Is it something that was inevitable? Um, I think we both agree that no, yeah. it was not preventable. <laughs> it was yeah. not preventable. And yes, it was inevitable. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, the degree, as we just said, you know, you know, could it have been less? Maybe. Could it have been worse? Maybe. You know, so. Yeah. Again, we go, come back to uh, Roosevelt knew that something needed to happen to, for us to enter the war. But I think what Roosevelt was thinking about was, you know, Wilson, President Wilson in World War I and the Lusitania, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were not going to enter World War I until the Lusitania was sunk. Right. And then suddenly we were, I think Roosevelt was looking at something like that happening, pointing us towards the European theater of operation. Mm-hmm. Now, we had plenty of indications, including the fact that we broke the diplomatic code that gave us, that should have told us that, Things were going to happen in the Pacific before they happened in the in Europe for us, mm-hmm. um, and and so I, I don't think you know he was surprised that it was the Pacific that w- became the tripwire for us. I think he was surprised at Pearl Harbor because, as you said, despite messages and things like that, we had war gamed it, and we did not believe the Japanese were capable of sending six aircraft carriers across the Pacific without being detected, which yeah. is what exactly what they did. Exactly. And, um, and so we didn't believe that that was in the realm. That was not a high probability event. High, the high probability events all occurred in the Western Pacific, right? Not in the mid Pacific, which is where Pearl Harbor was. So um, yeah, it was the, Lack of imagination. I mean, what we say again, I keep, I keep coming back to 9-11. We call it a failure of imagination. Mm-hmm. And the sam- same thing happened to cause us to not predict that Pearl Harbor was vulnerable. Right. Right. And it, and it was, it was, you know, in my opinion, a lot of it was arrogance yeah, by the United States. And, and there was still, even after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was still some of that arrogance, you know, that, that, that the United States, you know, even though we just got smacked in the mouth by a supposedly inferior race of, of um, people that, that, that it was going to, it was going to take a little bit more time (laughs) for Mm -hmm. us to get, keep getting punched in the face uh, for us to realize that we are fighting a very, very capable, exceedingly capable enemy, a very cunning enemy, somebody uh, that, that had prepared for a long time, to do what they did. And this is something else too. I just want to touch briefly before we go is that, you know, Pearl Harbor, while it was a surprise for us, obviously it wasn't a surprise for the Japanese. They launched the attack, but this is something that had been in the works for months. You mm-hmm. know, they had been planning this for months. So and they had to develop special tactics and exactly. And, and uh, rehearse, and, yeah. rehearse the, you know, the shallow Harbor aspect of the attack. Absolutely. So it, it was a planned action and, uh, you know, the Japanese got out of it what they put into it. You know, they knocked the U.S. Pacific fleet for the most part, the surface fleet, I should say, uh, the battle fleet. They knocked it out. But, uh, but I just want to jump in and make sure. sure that just for completeness, the racism went both ways. Oh, for sure. The Japanese didn't believe that as a race we had the moral uh, fortitude or courage or 
you know, fighting spirit or whatever you want to say, to stand toe to toe with them over the long haul and beat them. And I think they were they they started being surprised on December 7th at the degree to which we were able to throw lead up into the air. Sure. After after we did come to our senses and start to react to um, the attack, I think they were surprised by the aggressive response that day. And they continued to be surprised throughout the war. Of course, the most notable, uh, you know, example of that would have been would have been Midway, Midway. just a few months later, right. um, where they started realizing, my goodness, these folks actually do know how to fight. Not only do we know how to fight, we have the desire to fight. Absolutely. Yep. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it for this one, Bill. Like we could we could keep going for another three, four hours, but I don't think anybody wants to hear that. <laughs> no, exactly. <yeah. laughs> we, uh, we, we hope you enjoyed listening to this as much as we enjoyed talking about it. Uh, please subscribe and rate and review us on wherever you receive your podcasts. And uh, let us know what we did right and let us know what we did wrong. We'd love to hear from you, from our listeners. Uh, tune in next time to see what stories we uncover and discuss. And if you have any ideas or topics, again, please send them in. And uh, I'm Seth Perrin, and I want to say thank you guys very much for listening. Bill? And I'm Bill Toady, retired Navy captain. What a joy it is to talk about this stuff with Seth. And thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. Thanks. Thanks.